Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and in this video we're going to talk about ionic reactions, um, specifically the SN1 reactions, and so we're going to go over um, how to identify when they occur, what the mechanism is, what the stereochemical outcomes are, and what the limitations are of this particular reaction type. So first of all, right, SN1, um, just a little background information here, right, it's SN1 because it is a substitution, right, we have here um, on this molecule, the chlorine, right, ends up getting switched out by an OH group, so it's a substitution, we didn't just add stuff, we didn't just eliminate things, and it's a nucleophilic substitution uh, because the thing that's substituting out right here is water, and water in this mechanism is behaving as a nucleophile. Right, so it's a nucleophilic substitution, hence the S and the N. And then we have a first order kinetics, because what we'll see here in a second when we look closer at the mechanism, um, the first order kinetics, right, it's, it's a unimolecular reaction, just means that our rate is going to depend on the rate constant and the concentration of just one thing. So it's not the concentration of two things, nothing squared, um, it's not three things, etc. So it's just a unimolecular reaction, and I'll write this down now so it's in your notes, but this is going to depend on the substrate. And this is your substrate. Whatever your um, alkyl halide is. Um, and I might as well write that down here, right? So in all of these reactions, you're going to have your um, alkyl halide. And I'm saying alkyl halide for now. Um, it could be another uh, really good leaving group. It just has to have a very good leaving group on it. So it might be a mesylate or tosylate or something like that, triflate. Um, just something that's a very good leaving group. It doesn't have to be a halogen, but in, in all the examples I show you um, in this lecture, they'll, they'll be halogens. So this is your overall reaction, right? You have a substrate, you have a nucleophile, they react, you get a new thing. I got this T-butanol, and then I get H plus and Cl minus as um, side products. So let's take a look at what the actual mechanism here actually looks like. So same reaction here. I've got the I've got the same reaction, um, but I drew all of the lone pairs and stuff because I want to show you what the actual mechanism looks like. Now, previously, right, we learned about SN one reactions, and so I, I want to ask myself here: Why is this an SN one reaction? Um, could it be or, or could it not be? And so there's actually two reasons why this is not um, not going to be an SN two reaction. Right, because if you remember, um, for SN2 reaction, I had my nucleophile come in and kick out my leaving group, right? And remember we said we, it had to be a good nucleophile, it had to be have a nice full negative charge, and it had to have a strong attraction to the electrophile. And if we take a look at this example, I'll draw out water a little bit more here. Right, if I take a look at water, uh, it's not ionic, right? It's just a covalent compound, so I just have partial charges, a partial negative, partial positive, partial positive. Um, so I don't, it's not even a good nucleophile, right? It's, it's, a, it's a poor nucleophile because it doesn't have a full negative charge on it. It's not going to be strongly attracted to a positive charge. And if I look at my substrate, right, I've got a dipole here, partial positive, partial negative. Um, and that's also just a partial charge. So one problem here for um, this reaction, if you are trying to go the SN2 route, is that there's not enough attraction. Not enough attraction. between my partially negative nucleophile and the partially positive electrophile. And I'll say partially positive electrophile, right? So that's one problem, right? Again, in the SN2 reactions, we had like a full negative, I tried to do a partial positive. Here we only have a partial negative, I tried to do a partial positive, so it's just less attraction. So not enough attraction. The other problem, if you remember, right, SN2s, right, what type of substrate did SN2s work really well on? Did they work really well on uh, unhindered alkyl halides or substrates? Or did they work really well on hindered alkyl halides and substrates? And hopefully you remember, right, that SN2 reactions needed to do that backside attack, and they need to get to the backside of that C halogen bond, right, whatever the leaving group is. They need to get to the backside of it because that's where that antibonding orbital is. And if you look at this alkyl halide, right, it's a tertiary alkyl halide. This carbon, where the uh, chlorine is, it's got three carbon groups on it. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in the way. There's a whole bunch of steric hindrance. Um, it's just going to be harder for our nucleophile to get to the backside of that bond where the antibonding orbital is. So the other problem is that it's too crowded. Right? Too, too uh, crowded. Too crowded. Let's do too crowded. 
uh, it's too crowded, right? The problem is that there's there's no room for the nucleophile, right? Too much steric hindrance. And so we cannot do, we cannot just attack the backside of that bond and kick it out. So what's going to happen instead? Well, what has to happen instead is we have to just wait around for this leaving group, in this case chlorine, we need to just wait around for it to simply leave on its own, right? To just pop off by itself. So I need to wait for this CCL bond to spontaneously just pop off. And right, notice that I'm drawing the arrows from the CCL bond and I'm drawing them, I'm having them go to the chlorine because the chlorine is more electronegative. I'd rather have that negative than carbon be negative. And so what I'm going to get is I'm going to set up this equilibrium that, as you might imagine, is pretty terrible. It's not great, right? Because you're just breaking a CCL bond. But what that's going to do is that's going to give me that carbon now with the CH3s attached to it. And it's going to give me the chloride, and now it went from having three lone pairs to having four lone pairs. And if I go through and I do my formal charges right now, I know that the chlorine is negative, which is okay. It's very electronegative element. And my carbon now is positive, which is not terrible in terms of things you have to give positive charges to. Not very stable, uh, but not great. And so if you look at, and we'll talk more about stability in the next slide here. Um, um, but right now, right, it's a tertiary carbocation, which hopefully you remember is not that bad, right? So tertiary cations are relatively stable. So tertiary carbocations are relatively stable, right, relative to secondaries and primaries. Um, right, and hopefully you remember that's just because, right, we have... Um, three alkyl groups on here, which are donating electron density and through uh, hyperconjugation. So I've got my ter tertiary carbocation. Now, what's nice to see here, right, with this tertiary carbocation is that um, I've actually fixed both of the problems here on my um, reasons why I can't do an SN2 reaction, right? Before we said there was not enough attraction between a partially negative nucleophile and a partially positive electrophile, well, now I don't have a partially positive electrophile. I have a fully positive electrophile, right? So now my electrophile is has a full positive charge, which means it's going to be much more attracted to my electrophile that only has the partial negative charge, or my water is still the electrophile. So that's good. So I fixed that problem. Check. And then the other problem, right? We said that there's just too much crowding, too much sterics. I fixed that problem too. It might not be as apparent with the drawing that I have here, but right, I can look at this from the side. I have a CH3, I have a carbon, and then I have a CH3 and the other CH3, right? Because you want to keep in mind that this carbon here is um, sp2 hybridized. Whoops, well that's fine. This is uh, sp2 hybridized, which means it should be trigonal planar, right? So that means it's flat. It's 180 degrees between all of its um, all of those substituents there that are attached to that carbon. And so it's going to be easy for me to approach this now, right? At this carbon, I didn't finish this drawing, but at this carbon, right, I just have an empty p orbital, right? Here's my p that has that, that positive charge there. So I've got this flat trigonal planar, right? So uh, same, same molecule, here, right? These are, the, these are the same thing. I've got this flat trigonal planar intermediate. And so now I don't have to worry about the... Um, the steric hindrance either because now there's all kinds of room, right? The bond angles on the top of this uh, trigonal planar thing is just 180 because it's flat. It's just like a dish. There's just nothing really getting in the way here. And then it's, of course, it's 120 between those, those methyls there. But so there's tons of room. So I fixed those two problems. So now finally I can have my nucleophile be attracted to my electrophile. And I'm going to um, redraw my water. And so my water can now um, attack this electrophile. It's fully positive, lots of room. Um, I, my p orbital, right, is on top and the bottom, those lobes. It doesn't matter which one you attack. I'm just going to pick the top one for this, for this example. Um, this step is reversible. Let me draw these intermediates here. So now I've got, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to make it look like the product a little bit. So I've added water. Uh, water now no longer has two lone pairs, it only has one lone pair, and so the charge has moved on to the O. Uh, but oxygen, right, is not exactly super stable being positive, so it's going to want to kick off some electrons. 
So we're going to see those electrons get taken back. Um, oxygen can break any of these three bonds that are around it. It can break the one to the carbon, um, this one right here, which is fine. That's just going backwards. That's why this step is reversible. Or it could break um, one of the hydrogens off, right? We could lose a hydrogen from either one of those two sides, in which case it gets those electrons back and goes back to being just an alcohol. And then you have H plus floating around in solution. And that H plus realistically is either attached to water as H3O plus, some sort of hydronium thing. Uh, it's more probably more like a like a pentahydrate, really, but doesn't matter. Um, or that H plus will be on another, another alcohol. So it, it, the H plus gets spread out over the solution. And that's the general mechanism, right? So if you look at this, I basically have three steps for this neutral one, right? I have um, the first step, I have this second step, and I have a third step. So in the first step, the leaving group leaves. Second step, the nucleophile adds. Third step, I deprotonate that um, water to just go back to being an alcohol, which is my final product. Um, we're gonna talk more about kinetics in a second, but while I have this up here, I might as well write this down. Of these three steps, which one do you think is going to be the slowest one? The one where we just spontaneously break a bond and go from having no charges and full octets to having charges and broken octets? Or do you think it's going to be the one where we combine two things to start to fill octets? Or do you think that's going to be the last one where we just move an H from one O basically to another O to make hydronium? The first step, hopefully, should look the worst to you. This is the slowest step. This is the slowest step here, and that's going to be your rate determining step. Whoops. That's going to be your rate determining step, right? It's the only, um, it, remember that your rate determining step is always your slow step. Um, and in this case, it only you only have the substrate. You don't have the nucleophile involved in that step at all, which is why this is a first order reaction. And I'll mention this again in a second, but it's only first order because it only, you only need to have that, um, or the amount of substrate there is, is what affects the rate. Because i got to wait for that halogen to leave. So if I have more of those, more of them will leave, and then I have a faster reaction. The amount of water is irrelevant. So let's take a, another look at this. I just, I just redrew this here. Um, just kind of show you the mechanism again. So here's kind of like a cleaner version without all of those arrows and all of those notes around it. But I did want to say something about the energy diagram here, right? So here we have energy. So we're moving up. Here's our uh, progress of the reaction, of the reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate. And I'm going to go ahead and label these. Um, I'm going to say this stuff is what we're starting with. That's A. I'm going to say that this stuff, well, let me erase this because these are the same, same drawings here. Um, this stuff is B, this intermediate is C, and then finally we get to our products, which is D. And so what I want to do is I want to put on this energy diagram the relative energies of these so we can see kind of, you know, are we going uphill, downhill, what steps are slow and everything. So I will start here at just some arbitrary energy, and I'm going to call this A. Here's all my stuff from A, right? I, just the T-butyl chloride and water. They're neutral, I don't have any charges, they have full octets, relatively stable. Now if I go to B, right, we said in B, look at all these problems I have, right? I've, I just broke a bond, just spontaneously broke a bond that always requires energy. And you notice right here, I don't have an octet, right? So I've, I have a, I have lack an octet, which is a big problem uh, in chemistry, right? We want to try to avoid charges, and we really want to try to avoid octets, or, or uh, a lack of octets. We need to fill octets. And so that should be much, much higher in energy, right? That's much less stable than the starting stuff. So I'm going to go all the way up here, and we'll say that that's where the B stuff is, right? This should be much higher in energy. So I need to go from A all the way up to B. Now, if you look from B to C, right, that's where we combined, right? We combined our partially negative poor nucleophile. It's, it's water, but again, this electrophile is so hot because it's so positive, and it's really going to attract basically any nucleophile um, that there is. It'll attract any nucleophile. So in this case, we just have water, which again is poor. But when I combine these, I no longer have any atoms that do not have octets, right? So everything now has a full octet. which is huge, which is a really, really big deal. So if I go and I look at C here, 
the idea is that if I look at C, now I'm going to drop way down in energy. Um, let me do, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop way down in energy. to get to C. And then the last step here is just a small change in energy. Um, that because I'm just moving the positive uh, an H from this oxygen to realistically a different oxygen. Remember we said that this realistically is probably like on uh, H3O plus or it's going to stay on some of those alcohols, right? If your solvent is water, probably the hydrogen is going to be on water. And then you get to, to D. So this, this step here is just a little acid base reaction, um, small difference in energy. But you notice that we're going overall downhill because what we're doing is we're going from, um, well, because this reaction occurs, basically. If this reaction occurs, right, we should have an overall um, delta G or delta H that is negative, right? If the reaction is going to proceed, it's going downhill. Uh, because in theory, the OH bond, is, sorry, the OC bond is stronger than the CLC bond is, is the idea. Now, the important thing to realize here, and I'll talk about this more in the next slide, is that Right, we said that this was our rate determining step, right? That this activation energy, or you might see delta G double dagger, that activation energy is what's going to determine the rate. Uh, let me erase this so it's a little bit more clear. Activation energy, same thing as delta G double dagger. Um, that's going to determine our rate. And this is a tertiary alkyl halide, right? Imagine what would happen to this energy diagram if we had a secondary or a primary or, heaven forbid, a methyl um, a cation as an intermediate. What's going to happen to the energies then? What's going to happen to the relative rates? So like I was saying on that previous slide, the identity of the substrate matters a ton. Which, uh, which type of alkyl halide you have, really, it really makes a big, big difference, right? So here we have a tertiary alkyl halide. Here we have a primary one. Here's a methyl. Uh, here's a secondary, here's a tertiary, and then lastly we have another secondary, right? Because we're looking at the carbon that the alkyl group is attached, that the halogen is attached to, and we're seeing how many carbon groups are attached to it. And that was important, right? Remember, because when we have um, these leaving groups leave, the idea is that they're going to form a carbocation, and so the more um, substituted that carbocation is, the more stable it's going to be, right? So if I form this carbocation here, I want to have one, two, three groups stabilizing that carbocation so that um, through, through hyperconjugation, right, to stabilize that carbocation so that I don't have to go up as much of a hill, right? Because if I start here at some neutral compound and I need to get to a tertiary carbocation, um, I'm going to have a hill to climb no matter what. But if I have a primary carbocation, like this one, right? If I have a, a, a primary carbocation, the idea is that a primary carbocation is going to be much less stable than a tertiary one because it only has one alkyl group that would stabilize the carbocation, right? So if I have a primary uh, alkyl halide, it's going to have only one group donating electrons to that positive charge, which is not going to help stabilize it as much as three would. Now you can imagine if I go to uh, methyl, that's going to be crazy unstable, right? Because that's only, that has no carbons helping whatsoever. So I'll put methyl way up here. So methyls are just going to be way, way, way too high in energy. And then lastly, I've got um, right a secondary here. And secondaries, as you might imagine, are going to be somewhere between uh, primary and, and tertiary. Yeah, primary and tertiary. And then I got another tertiary and another secondary. So what we're going to see here, right, basically for this reaction, what we're going to see is um, for, normal, for normal reactions at normal temperatures, we can only form the tertiary. That's the only reasonable one because this is going to have the smallest activation energy. So I'll say for, for normal uh, reaction conditions, it's not really forceful, not really hot, reaction conditions, um, only tertiary substrates will react. Will react, right? And again, that's just because secondary is slower, primary is so slow, and methyl is so slow, we're just not going to see them, right? They're just going to be too slow for you to progress through this reaction. And so if I wanted to go through these here, right, and I wanted to make notes, I would say that um, 
the this one absolutely can, right? Can do SN1 reactions because it's tertiary. Um, the primary one cannot. The methyl one cannot. Secondary, we're gonna say no for normal temperatures and everything, but Realistically, if you heat it up or you reflux it, you could get it to go. It'd just be a lot slower. Um, this tertiary, yes, because again, tertiary is really easy to get to. And here's another secondary. And I said no here because it's uh, too high in energy. But here, I'm actually going to say yes. And so the question is, why can that secondary alkyl halide react, whereas the other one can't? If I look at the alkyl halide uh, that I circled here in purple, and in fact, I'll draw it in purple. If I look at this one that I circle in purple, its secondary carbocation, right, has a positive charge. And again, it's stabilized by two alkyl groups donating an electrons through hyperconjugation from that or orbital overlap. But if I take a look at this um, one over here with the bromine and the, and the aromatic ring, if I draw that sucker out, what's great about that is, yes, it's secondary, right? So that it has those groups donating electrons, but this positive charge is actually delocalized throughout this ring, right? So this positive charge, I won't draw all the resonance structures, but this positive charge is resonance stabilized, right? And it have, you keep moving it throughout the ring, but it's resonance stabilized. So it's actually much lower in energy. So being um, allylic or benzylic, which means being double one, one carbon away from an alkene or one carbon away from an aromatic ring, um, stabilizes you. So you are lower in energy now, right? You can imagine that the secondary is going to be much lower than a secondary where there is no resonance stabilization. So you want to keep that in mind too, right? Big idea with SN1 is you want to see, can I form that carbocation? Is that carbocation going to be very stable? Tertiary, yes. Secondaries and primaries that are resonance stabilized, those are okay. So now we need to talk about the stereochemistry or the stereochemical outcome of these reactions. Uh, in the previous examples, I've only really shown you uh, an example where they had like three methyl groups. So there was no stereochemistry, there was no chirality, there were no chiral centers. However, in this example, right, I do have a chiral center, right? Where my halogen is, it's a chiral center. And so I'm going to make do a reaction at that chiral center. So I need to pay attention to what's happening with the stereochemistry. If I look at this right now, right, my, it looks like I've got the S conformer not conformer, the S configuration of this, um, this uh, molecule, my, my alkyl halide. If I look over on the right-hand side, what I'm saying is I'm going to produce two different um, stereoisomers here, um, one S and one R. So how does that look like? Why, why do I form two? Why do I not just form one? Um, so let's take a look at this mechanism again here. Uh, SN1 reaction, right? I've still got a tertiary alkyl halide. I've got a poor nucleophile. Got a poor nucleophile, so I know that right, poor nucleophiles really can only do SN1 type reactions. Tertiaries, um, if you watch my other videos and you're coming back to this, this will make more sense to you, but they can do E2s or um, SN1s, E1 type reactions. And so this is going to be an SN1 reaction because that's what I've got. I, I've got a water which uh, can only do SN1s. Tertiary alkyl halides can do SN1s, so that's what I'm going to do. And if you remember, right, we were just saying that the first step is that your leaving group just leaves. So I draw one arrow going from the BrC bond up onto the bromine. That's going to give me this intermediate down here and also the bromide. Let me add the bromide here. Also the bromide. And again, though, we went trigonal planar and we're flat, right? It's the same intermediate. So we have a flat trigonal planar intermediate. And with this flat trigonal planar intermediate, what we can do now, right, in the other example, I said, oh, water can add from the top or the bottom face. It doesn't really matter. But now it is going to matter, right? Because if I add, if I have my nucleophile add to the top lobe of this P orbital, this empty P orbital where the carbocation is, then I'm going to get this. If I have the bromine, or sorry, the um, water attack the bottom lobe, let me just erase that real quick. If I have an attack from the bottom side, the bottom face, then I'm going to get this product. And those are different products, right? Those are different molecules. They're enantiomers to one another. They're different. They're not the same thing. You, they're non-superposable mirror images. And because this is flat and there's nothing directing it, 
saying that it has to go to the top or it has to go to the bottom, you get what we say is roughly, roughly a 50-50 mixture of, of stereoisomers here. All right, so this is going to be roughly 50-50. We're saying there's roughly a 50-50 chance, roughly a 50-50 mixture of stereoisomers. Of stereoisomers. Now, um, for this class, we're not going to get hardcore into these mechanisms. Realistically, you tend to get a little bit more inversion than you have retention of stereochemistry, just because as this big old bromine over here is leaving, it kind of is, is protecting the face that it left, right? So as this big old bromine up here is leaving, um, water tends to add on the opposite side of that a little bit more. So you tend to get a little bit more inversion, which in this case would be R. But for the most part, roughly 50-50. That's what they're going to ask you on things like the MCAT and the ACS exam. Um, that SN1s do have mixtures, and they're roughly 50-50. Now we can continue with this mechanism here. <clears throat> um, it's just like before. Right now I have water. It can break any one of those three bonds. It can leave, which is going backwards, or we can take um, electrons from the hydrogen to give us this product. Check. Uh, and then the same thing for the other one, right? It has... Um, it's going to break a HO bond also to get back electrons to make that product check. And so what we get here in the end is we get roughly a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, right? These are enantiomers, not diastereomers, because all their carbon centers change. So when you have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, we call that a racemic mixture. Which is a 50-50 mix of specifically enantiomers. Right, enantiomers. So not diastereomers, not structural isomers, nothing like that. And what's interesting about the 50-50 mixture of enantiomers is that if you put them in a polarimeter, the specific rotation is gonna be zero. That's a, that's a property of a racemic mixture. And that's because, right, if this S thing has a specific rotation of, let's just say, and I'm totally making this up, 32 degrees, the idea is that it's an antiomer, right, is going to have a specific rotation of negative 32 degrees because enantiomers have opposite specific rotations. So they end up canceling each other out, which is why the mixture is then zero, right? So if you have the exact same amount of each, then the mixture is going to have no optical activity. It's not going to bend plain polarized light really whatsoever. So you want to pay attention to, if you're doing an SN1 reaction you're, and you have a chiral center that you're doing the reaction at, it is going to give you a mixture of, of stereoisomer. So let's summarize this here, right? Um, background information here, right? Nucleophilic substitution, it's first order. And like I said, the rate law, right? The rate depends on K times only one thing. And we said that was the substrate, right? Just depends on the substrate. Uh, the nucleophile doesn't matter at all because it's not in that slow first step where the leaving group just has to leave on its own. Nucleophiles, basically any nucleophile will, will work as long as it's not some gigantic monster, um, but any nucleophile will add into a tertiary carbocation. Now, that nucleophile, if it's really good or really basic, might do a different type of reaction, but there's no limitation for SN1 necessarily on the type of nucleophile, and that's just because right, you have a full carbocation and you have tons of space, so anything really could add to that carbocation. Substrates, we said that really only works with tertiary substrates, um, you know, assuming that you're not heating it up like crazy. So that's what we're looking for, tertiary substrates, because we need stable carbocations, right? That's kind of kind of a big deal. We need the stable carbocation intermediate. Stable carbocation. And then stereochemistry, the stereochemical outcome, right, is that it's going to give you a mixture um, roughly 50-50 of stereoisomers. Now, though they could be diastereomers if there's some other chiral center, or they might be enantiomers like I showed you in my example, but again, the idea is roughly 50-50, technically a little more inversion, but that's not that super important. And then as far as the solvents go, um, I didn't really talk about this too much in this video, but they go faster in polar protic solvents. And that's just because if you have um, something, again, I'll draw the, the chloride here, if you have something like this, the idea is that a polar protic solvent, so we're talking about something that can hydrogen bond, something that can form a hydrogen bond, like water, like methanol, I'll use, I'll use ethanol here. The idea is that if you have um, something like ethanol, right, something that can hydrogen bond, you've got this positive charge that is just hanging out, um, 
that is sticking out from a, a molecule, right? Hydrogens are super small. You've got this negative charge. So they tend to hydrogen bond really, really well with the leaving group. And if you have a whole bunch of those, I'll draw another one here, right? Imagine that there's a whole bunch more. I'm not going to draw the like 10 that would really be around it. But the idea is that those partially positive hydrogens can um, help this leaving group leave, right? So in that first step, when you have to leave to form that carbocation, they help it leave. So if you have a polar protic solvent, then you help that leaving group leave a little bit better, right? Because the idea is that those uh, solvent molecules, whether it's water or ethanol or acid or whatever it is, those solvent molecules can help solvate, so these are positives, can help solvate that um, ion really well, and they can help it leave a little bit better. So it helps lo to lower the energy of that uh, first transition state. So they, they, they tend to be a little faster in polar product solvents. Don't focus too much on the solvent effects because it's not like it's going to change the reaction type. It just might happen a little faster in like water versus acetone, for example. That's all we're talking about. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Let's do these real quick. Um, well, first I'd recommend you pause and just take a crack at these, right? Make sure that you've got a secondary alkyl halide, figure out where your nucleophile is, pay attention to any stereochemistry, and draw the product or products that you would get from these four reactions. So go ahead and pause, take a crack. So now um, let's go through these here. Uh, definitely have a, a tertiary alkyl halide. I have a poor nucleophile, so it looks like we're doing an, an SN1 reaction. And I don't have any stereocenter here, right? I have two ethyl groups. I don't have a stereocenter. So all I really need to do is just replace wherever my halogen was, right? So here I had my leaving group. Um, I know that that's going to pop off to give me uh, the carbocation right where that was. I know that my methanol is going to add to it. So I'm going to get an O. CH3 and an H and a positive. I know that that oxygen is going to take back electrons, so that's going to leave me with O CH3. So that should be my product, right? And then technically also an H plus and a Cl minus. But in OCHEM, we rarely care about those side products, but technically to be balanced, you got to put the H plus and Cl. I'm not going to look for that. I don't really care. Now, if I look at the second example here, um, we've got uh, the same substrate. All right, so it's still tertiary, but now we have NaF, so I'm going to break this up because it's ionic, Na plus, F minus. Uh, F minus is definitely a nucleophile. It's, it's actually a good nucleophile, it can, so it can, still do, um, it can still do SN1 reactions. They can do SN2 or SN1. And I've got a tertiary, so it's the same thing, right? Chlorine is going to leave. I'm going to form a carbocation, and so really I'm just going to replace this with the fluorine itself. There's my substitution there. All right, so I'm just going to... Uh, re replace the chlorine with the fluorine. If I go to the uh, third one, look over here, right? Again, I've got water, which I know is a poor nucleophile. So I'm thinking SN1. I go over here and I have a secondary alkyl halide, which is a problem, right? Because again, we said the secondary uh, carbocations are not that stable. So I'm probably not going to see this reaction occur in any reasonable amount of time, so I'm going to write no reaction. It's too slow. It's just going to take forever. Um, we do, a, re we do a, a, a reaction in lab where we try to get a secondary alkyl uh, bromide to react, and it takes weeks. It just, it just takes weeks at room temperature. Now, again, you could boil it or put it under pressure and heat and everything, but normal, normal reaction conditions, you, you just don't see them. It's secondary carbocations, too high in energy. And then lastly, I have this one down here, the fourth one. Again, I'm using water, which is a poor nucleophile. Um, again, I have a tertiary alkyl halide, but in this case, I see that I have a chiral center. So I am going to make sure that I don't draw one product. I'm going to draw two products. So I'm going to draw one where my OH is coming out at me, and I'm going to draw one where the OH is going away from me. Right, and I know I'm going to get these, uh, these two, in this case, in antimers, and they're going to be roughly 50-50. Right, so I paid attention to the fact that I have chiral centers. You have chiral centers to start with, you have chiral centers to end with, got to pay attention to that. Anyways, that's 
SN1 in a nutshell, hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Definitely do practice worksheets, find things in the book, etc. Um, good luck and happy studying.